So yeah, let's start with our first speaker, uh, who is Elizabeth Simmons. Uh, a funny thing about how uh, I met her, I was an event, uh, at an event in London, it's called Video Brains, it's a really cool event, and uh, uh, Elizabeth was giving a talk there, uh, and then Marina just texted me, uh, we should get this Elizabeth Simmons to talk at Game Happens, and I was like, she's right here in front of me now. <laughs> so it was really, uh, it was really incredible. Sometimes life gives you that sort of funny things. So, great. Uh, Elizabeth is a dancer, game maker, artist. Uh, she does uh, a lot, sort of, lot of things about games and performance and uh, live games. She uh, she has this crazy event in London, where, which I was doing was that absolute chaos, and it was so funny. Uh, so I think she will talk a bit about that. So uh, give a round of applause to Elizabeth Simmons. I'm slightly too short for this. But uh, I am Elizabeth Simone. I am a live game designer and lots of other very silly things that I find extremely interesting. And I'm going to be talking about chaos entirely. I'm talking about how you can embrace it and how you can, in other times, need to control it. And I will have lots of very chaotic slides. But first, I'm going to give a little bit of an introduction about me and how I came into, into games, because actually, I haven't been in games that long. I've only been really working on this for the last year and a half, because before then, I was training as a ballerina, and when you train as a ballerina, you can't really do anything else. It is pretty much physically impossible, so you have no time. But I came to London to study choreography, and while I was studying choreography, we were learning about scoring practices, where that would be anything from rolling dice to making some squiggly marks on paper and using that as a reference for where you might move or creating a set of rules. And as we went through these processes, I was like, wait a second. Squiggly lines on paper, lots of, lots of rules. There were intense documents that defined each character and how those characters felt about the other characters and how they would interact in different ways depending on how those characters were feeling. Like, and, then, and then the rules like, wait a second, these are basically games. And not just like games like improv impro improvisatory games of stand, sit, and lay down. These are like games with narrative, like dice rolls. I was like, I think that's just what I'm going to study. I think I'm just going to study how I can actually make a full game and make that structure create a performance. Oh, and these don't, aren't timed. So that's kind of how I started to make my first things. I, through my Masters of Fine Arts course, started to create these different things where we had I had a murder mystery where you have one part of it is actually live action Mortal Kombat with LARP, LARP fighters, and you had to give them different kind of like orders of hits, and whoever won would get the clue from that faction, and they would have a, they'd have a better chance of solving the murder. Or the next room was doing Mao, which you're not allowed to tell the rules of, so they had to just watch a group of people play Mao and try and figure out what those rules were in order to get another clue. So I had all of these different games happening in order to kind of create this larger game which was very interesting and a very interesting part of my kind of process. Oh. Then I started to do games in raves, which I will touch on a little bit later, but great, games in raves where you have thousands of people kind of milling about listening to music from like 10 o'clock at night to 6 o'clock in the morning and having them experience these different parts of games throughout the evening and becoming different characters or fighting with the fighting with balloons and the great barbarian bash or meeting the confectionomancer and having these different small little interactions happening in this large space. After that, 
I started working for Fire Hazard Games, and I've now run, I've, only, I've worked there for about a year now, I think I've run over 100 games for I don't even know how many people. I have absolutely no clue. Um, and I have a very serious face. Chaos is inherent in live games because you have half of the script written. You have your characters, you have your rules, you have your, this is where I think the players will go, this is what I think the players will do, and that never is what happens ever. I've had people, because it's part of a performance, so you're like, you have your actors and you're training them, okay, like I think if they come up to you and they interrogate you in this way, I would like you to inter react in this way. What you don't expect is then you get the radio call of, well, they left the murder weapon behind, but what they did before that is they accidentally went so far bad cop that they assaulted the witness who wasn't being questioned about the murder at all. Like, how did, and I was like, how did they respond? It's like, they just kind of pretended to start crying and didn't answer any more questions. Like, well, that's not one of the things we told you to do, but that was a very good re reaction. Um, but I guess like the easiest way to kind of describe, like, have, have any of you guys actually played a live game? Hands up. Okay, some of you. Have any of you guys played like um, an escape room, which is similar? And have any of you gone to interactive theater? I think it's pretty much the same subset for all of those. <laughs> so that doesn't really help, because my way of describing live games is the place between an escape room and interactive theater. But the way to describe live games is the place between an escape room and interactive theater. It's where you have, because generally the games that I create because they're not in one small space. They're generally either it throughout an entire warehouse or throughout the streets of London or in a large park at night or in museums. So you don't have the confined space that you're working with. You're working with a large, you're just, you're just not gonna be able to see me. I can't stand on half point anymore. I say, it's just gonna, it's just gonna be here. <laughs> um, and it's more than just like, in real life video games, because you can't forbid choices. You can try, but yes, you can, you can lock a door behind a player, but they can try and break it down. It is a thing they can try and do. You can make it look like, you're definitely not allowed to touch this thing. This is definitely not in world. This is out of character. It doesn't matter. If players go, ooh, that thing looks shiny, they're going, to try and, they're going to try and do something. They're gonna do things that you don't expect them to do. And, but that's what makes it so interesting, is because you, you, you create a game, and then you kind of go, here you go. Let's see, I, th I think I've got what you're gonna do. I think I have a way for you to get through this, and then have that all fall apart, but have enough structure there that the actors can make it work, even though, as like Fede was saying earlier, you have no idea how it happened and how it works. So I'm going to first talk about my two most different games. First being Rumpus, and the second being Raiders. And I like it because they have alliteration. So Rumpus is held in Islington Metalworks, which is in London, and it's again, it's seven rooms, and you've got metal mariachi bands in one room, and in another room, you've got Swedish folk, and in another room, there's salsa dance classes, and in another room, you have some sort of things with accordions, and in another room, you have a kazoo orchestra. And in all of this, you have about a thousand people who've all come dressed up in very intricate costumes that are there to experience all of it and also experience, like, potentially become more intoxicated as the night goes from 10 o'clock at night to 6 o'clock in the morning, which makes for a very interesting level of play because the choices they make at 10 
are very different from the choices they make at four in the morning. Initially, this was terrifying, because I come from the world of ballet. I come from a world where you know exactly where your pinky finger goes, you know exactly what pose you're going to be in now, you know exactly how, what line you're going to be in with every other single dancer, and they're going to have the exact same foot pose as you. This could not be further from r Rumpus, where everything, just like you walk in the door and it's chaos. There's swirling lights everywhere, there's music kind of, it's kind of like an extremely complicated, discordant version of when you walk into a music school and you hear all of the different music, but if you're on acid. So for this one, I had to kind of really go out of my box. I got to go out of my um, comfort zone and really embrace chaos for the first time and just go, okay, I know this is not going to go to plan, and this is going to be beautiful because of that. Now, Raiders is held in the Victoria and Albert Museum, which has the very strict risk, risk assessments, and chaos is not allowed. Instead, you have to quickly control the chaos, and you have to know, I have all of your contingency plans for, if this happens, I will do this, and I have these characters patrolling these areas so that if anyone even thinks of moving slightly quickly, I will be there. And I've run that game pretty much every single weekend for the last year, once or twice every single weekend. So I've seen lots of players, players try that game, and I know it inside and out. And it's basic, so basically what I'm going to kind of go through is like the different approaches for how, you, how in some games you can kind of foster that chaos and make anyone decide, yes, I will go to the confectional manse. The confectional manse told me I should join the Panda Rebellion and then go and create a secret device that turns everyone into pandas and take over the Empress's throne, which was not an option in the storyline. Or uh, have a very sedate but kind of educational adventure where you walk through the Victoria and Albert Museum and solve very complicated puzzles and learn about all the statues around you. Rumpus. So the interesting thing about Rumpus is they don't expect games to happen. It is not a, again, it's an indoor music festival that I sometimes become involved in. Santi, who runs it, will go, will, whenever he wants to add a little bit something extra, he wants to add in an extra game, he'll bring me in and go, okay, this is the theme, this time, well, for this one, I actually was involved from the beginning. So it was a choose your own adventure theme where you could become, let's see, a zombie businessman or a LARPer playing a barbarian who's playing a LARPer or a unicorn hunter, or an X-Factor singer who has been spurned, or a femme fatale spy agent. So it's in that kind of situation, being able to bring the players into your world really quickly is very important. But before that, I had my first experience of a game ever, which was Endless Quests in the Coronet Theater with an actual, it's for decompression, which is basically Burning Man in a theater when, in November when people in London are starting to get kind of go, like itch to go back to Burning Man. And this was when I accidentally became part of the unicorn subculture, which I didn't know existed which once I learned what that was and how it, that it existed, made the evening make a lot more sense. But it did mean that when I was expecting people would kind of go like, oh, they're not gonna work, because there, it was really maze-like. It was really hard to find any of the game portions, because I didn't really know how to both foster the chaos and make it structured enough 
that people would be able to find the next thing they were supposed to see. But because people really wanted to become unicorn knights, it did end up working because people actually made it through the end of the game, which I was not expecting. Now, the game that we create that I created for Rumpus, which is I learned that I needed to not make a linear game. Because if you make a linear game at Rumpus, that doesn't work because people kind of jump in and jump out or they go, ooh, that's an interesting room, I will go to that room. Or it's like, oh, why is that person wearing a Lord of Misrule costume? I would like to talk to the Lord of Misrule. So, you ha so I had to make a game that allowed you to see an actor who might be at the very end of the quest and still be able to play. But what I didn't expect is that people would embrace this and love it. So I made half of the thing going, it'll take, someone will play this for about an hour and then they will go back to the metal mariachi bands because it's a metal mariachi band and it's fantastic. And instead, they didn't leave and they had a fantastic time and they actually created storylines for themselves because they didn't want to stop playing. And now I need your help. Because how do we, yes, let's see. Okay, I don't think so. Let's see, let's see. Uh, oh. Now yeah, we, we have to go to the other screen, but it's, it's not oh. maybe. Yeah. How does this work? Yeah, we'll oh. switch it uh, uh. there in some way. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Okay. Uh, there we go. Do you need sound? Uh, uh, is it possible? Yeah. So we probably uh, put the jack. One second. So. Yes. Wow. My name, darling, is Madonna Fears. I am here at Rumble today because in 1991, I entered the Eurovision Song Contest and I was stolen. The award was stolen from me, Iceland. So I'm here tonight to take the stage because I failed. Oh no. So basically, he's about to take what is right to the I need to go to the quest station first to find out what my quest will be. Because I have a feeling that I, if I'm going to take on Sweden, I might need a weapon. But I have no idea where to find it. By the way, this is not an actor. This is just a, someone who showed up and was really keen. No! Okay, so I'm just going to paraphrase what happens. Um, and it might show up again and it might not. But basically, so this guy became really keen. He was a spurned X Factor star. And he went to go and get, he went to the bureaucracy table to get his license to join the big barbarian bash. This is kind of what walking through Rumpus is like. The big barbarian bash, which is um, fighting oh, with inflatable weapons. and that weapons. is me with a different haircut. You can enter and you can fight just with a balloon, or we're bribing people to play, so that they go to the bureaucracy and that's table Santee, who and makes get a Rumpus, license, who is also they get awesome. an inflatable sword. And fighting with an inflatable sword is a lot more fun than fighting with a balloon. Which is actually wrong. People no. enjoy fighting with balloons more. I, I, did, I, I thought they didn't, but they do. That's apparently all we're going to get from that. That's fine. But yes. So, So Rumpus is already kind of strangeness personified, but I didn't expect people to go, yes, I am failed X Factor star. 
but instead of going on the stage, I will fight with the balloon to get my rightful crown back, which is exactly what he did, except for he failed miserably, but was so happy with his failure that he was just like super excited. He's like, yes, I can sleep happy now. I know I have done my best. Um, or we had another person who, was, who had never been to Rumpus, who ended up going on a lot of quests. Like, um, she met the confectionomancer and then realized that she needed to go see Disco Tits, who was the new judge for X Factor. And then from that went to go and see the rebellion, but didn't believe in the rebellion. So instead got balls from the ball pit and threw them at the confectionomancer because she disagreed with his uh, initial thing initial reading of what biscuit she liked. And that was, again, not a choice I had expected. And we did lose a lot of balls from the ball pit that evening because that ended up being people's favorite thing to do, which was still okay. It was still a lot of fun. But yes, lessons learned from chaos is that players will make endings if you don't. They will take all of the secret weapon parts and confetti cannons, and they will take down the Empress, just because there is an Empress. And so if they don't get anything else to do, that is what they will do. And they will make it fabulous, and there will be glitter, but that Empress is going down. The other, and I just, I guess, I got kind of nervous. Because this, like, this is a little bit weird. I don't know. I don't know that they're going to like it. And the people just got excited. They enjoyed, they, they got to be different people. They got to take on a role that wasn't them in a place where they're already somewhat intoxicated and high and looking for that kind of fun. And I guess I, I could have anticipated this, but I got too anxious. I was like, I just don't know. And then, yeah, people will get excited. Also, if you put an actor in a cupboard, make sure they don't have a bottle of ginger wine or two. That's a really important one if you're interested in making live games. Um, and that your crew will have just as much fun. If you make it kind of, because if you, that's kind of the fun of the chaos, is that if you have people, like you, you've trained them for a while, but again, they have no idea what's going to happen. So they spend the entire night just go giving you radio calls of, oh my god, this fantastic thing just happened. They just kind of took over my throne. I don't know why, but I guess it's theirs now. I guess I'm done. Can I go be a different character now? Um, yeah, swishing. Swishing is important. If you make live games, you need swishing. But yeah, chaos is your friend. Um, basically, accept it especially for rumpus, except anything when you're going to do a live game in not a museum. Just accept it, embrace it, and yes, definitely dance the mariachi band when the radio is quiet. Raiders. So, now that I've talked a lot about how to embrace chaos, I'm going to mention a little bit how in, a, in the same kind of world, it's still a performative game. It's still, you still have crew, you still have acted out scenes. The players take on roles. But in this time, you ha I had to make it so, I had to design the game. Um, so initially, I hadn't designed the, the first Raiders, but I've just gone through and designed Raiders, the sunken tea set. Because the Wingback Society lost their tea set and it was tragic. And so everyone had to go back to the v &A Museum to help them find this tea set. It was really important. But having people move wildly through museums is not an option. Having people making impromptu confetti-powered devices is not something that works in a museum game. So it was very much about kind of crafting a role for the players that was much more about sedateness and intellectualness and walking and making it so that was fun, which it is. It's just a very different type of experience, making sure that instead of having open-ended things for my actors going, well, I think they may do this, it's like, 
well, if they don't open that box, they can't get that bit, they can't get that bit, and that's fine, they can fail this way, but they only have this much time in this area because we have to keep people moving through because the museum doesn't want us to be here so long. And that sounds really boring, but as a player, it's not. I, I promise, you're looking very quizzical, but I promise it's not boring. Because um, you still have the opportunity to try and fail, which is my favorite thing about live games, is when people get to fail in interesting ways. Oh, I have photos. Oh look, they pop up. I have a confession to make. My fiance makes all of the slideshows because I'm really bad at slideshows. So I'm always surprised when they do cool things. But yes, so people have a lot of fun walking through. at these great things. They don't need the kind of running about kind of fun. This is, they're able to get into that mindset. And, but it's kind of, you have to carefully randomize the clues so you don't cause obstructions. So you make sure that you only have one team at any given clue, at any given time, using a very carefully constructed coded system, um, which you would never need in a rumpus thing. You need to have, but that way, in a way that the players will never know, they're being carefully controlled to still have agency, but make it so it works for the environment around them. Now I'm going to move on to something completely different, which is the horror game that we ran, Shadow over Southwark, and mention how this is a completely different chaos. So in Rumpus, it's all about embracing chaos, and Raiders is all about controlling the player's chaos so that it doesn't take over the museum. In Shadow, I got to deal with a completely new kind of chaos, and that is called Parks at Night with Teenagers, <laughs> which is dealing with environmental chaos that want to just, just mess with things, just to see what happens which is not allowed when I'm stage managing. I'm not a huge fan of having people mess with things when I'm stage managing. Oh no, no, go back. There we go. So Shadow Over Southwark is the game that actually needed the most chaos control. It's like the museum, of course, you have the clue randomization. You make sure that the, everything is expertly timed. But Shadow of the, over Southwark was a, a Victorian horror game set with monsters from another world leaking in to a park that had almost no lighting, which is terrible because I'm afraid of the dark. And I ran almost every single one of those games. And you would think that if you control all the monsters, it's not scary. But that is not the case. I don't know why, this is kind of a tangent. However, I don't know why, I still can't figure out, because I had a radio. I could literally say, Waldgeist, I need you to move into the light and be very still and don't scare me at all. And I would know exactly where all of them were and yet I was still terrified of them. But it was less about, again, it was less about removing the chaos from play, but from the real world. It's, from, it's having elderly women who would use the park at night and making sure you con controlled the situation and you had the security in the right area so they would feel safe because they didn't particularly like having monsters in their park. So it's kind of controlling that element so that they have a safe pathway. They know this is where the security guard is, the wild geist is your friend, everything is okay. Or having, even though you have big monsters, having a big security guard near them. So if, if teenagers decide, you know what, I'm the toughest of my group, I can take on the monster, and then attempt to do so. Because again, I am, I am not the nicest of stage managers. 
I do not take kindly to people threatening my monsters. That is a weird sentence. <laughs> but I don't. And they became my nemeses. And I won. But that was, again, it was very much about, while before, it was controlling where the players went. This was controlling where the public would be able to enter and making sure I knew who was in the park, who was not in the park, had eyes on the ground at all times, and had a good radio system. So again, because the whole point is that the players had no idea that there was anything wrong. And in actuality, there was never anything wrong because it was all dealt with. But it was like they had no idea that this was a consideration that was in the... Okay, cool. Uh, this is a consideration that was in play. Let's see, where are we at now? Ah! And kind of the entire thing that this has been leading up to is my favorite thing in the world. Risk assessments. I hate risk assessments. But instead of talking about risk assessments, I'm actually, oh, there's a smiley face. <laughs> instead of talking about risk assessments, I'm going to ignore this slide and just leave it up here. And instead talk about something way cooler, because I now have, as of earlier this week, so I don't have it in the slideshow yet, a different type of chaos I can talk about. And that is brand new projects using other people's IP, which is very interesting, that is. So we have something in development that is not signed off in any way yet, which is the thing I have to say. But we are now at Firehazard working on a couple of different things, a couple of really exciting projects. Do I have a slide that's not risk assessments? I think this might say thank you on it. It does. So we'll go back to risk assessments. Ah, I have a blank one. That works. I'm just going to leave that there. Do, can I walk away from the mic, as I have been doing, or is that terrible for video? Oh, OK, cool. Okay, so, oh wow, now I'm really loud. Excellent. But no, so we have um, a new project that is in the works. Or have, has anyone heard of the TV show Hunted? You're not very useful. Like, I, I've already talked to you about it. I don't... Anyway, so it's, it's, a game, it's a TV show where you try to go on the run. You become... 10 fugitives and you have to disappear and you're not but you're not allowed to do e like the things like leave the country you have to stay in a particular area otherwise the show doesn't work very well because then they won't be able to actually find you because they don't actually have powers of the state so they're just pretending but we are beginning to do a new a new project where we're working with this intellectual property we're working with them to create a live game version which I was like, oh, cool, it's already a game, that's fine. And I didn't quite realize that then you have to work within really strict brand guidelines. And you have to work within the narrative of what's happening. And so I've been, and you have to make sure, because I do lots and lots of venue visits for just, because we run, our, our basic game is City Dash, which is just kind of plain and simple scavenger hunt in different parts of London and we switch to a new part of London every month which means you're pretty much consistently looking for new venues and going okay in this zone what is there anything I need to work, watch out for making sure you're not playing on private property making sure it's like okay what are, what are the tricky bits about this area and but I, what I haven't done before is going does this venue have the right feel for what they feel like is the, the correct narrative, which is a completely different kind of experience. And it's not so much controlling chaos as in people, like players, or external 
or as embracing chaos as rumpus, but it's kind of mitigating chaos to have the correct narrative, which is a new one for me. But so that we have, that is a brand new project that has been super interesting. The other thing I guess that's happening, so I'm gonna kind of talk about new things now, because I've covered all the stuff I've already done, um, which is why I have no slides for these new things, because they're kind of new. That was not a very good sentence. <laughs> <laughs> but so, uh, along with going on to like starting to work with bigger and in more interesting IPs, um, we also have working, Santi has new projects. So Santi is the guy that runs Rumpus. He also runs, I think he's the temple master at Glastonbury or something. And he's got some sort of like live events title that's really awesome, which I need to steal, that's something like temple master where he's making, he's watching over like 2,500 people, 25,000, no, 250,000. Wow, I got that number really wrong. Like 250,000 people this next weekend. So he's getting really, he has like some really exciting ideas for making more live games with me that now have, cool, that now have like, because I was like, a thousand people, a thousand people is a lot of people. Again, I've only been doing this for about a year and a half. A thousand people is a lot. So we've started to look at bigger venues and how we can end up making it so that, because part of the thing I love about Rumpus is that not everyone plays, but everyone is affected because everyone will see um, the Barbarian Bash happening, then they will walk past, and that will kind of change their experience of the night. So it's trying to figure out how to kind of scale that from a thousand people who are only walking through seven rooms to more than a thousand people who are walking through many, many rooms with lots and lots of actors, which is a very different experience. And I think that's about all. Was that okay? Yes. I think that's about all, because I think that I'm, that's all of the new projects that I'm working on that I can talk about right now. So, I am going to redo this slide that is bright. There. There we go. Yes. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.